Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Alan B. Larkin Symposium on the American Presidency at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, my name is Ken Osgood. I am director of the History Symposium series at FAU, and I'm a professor in the History Department. And I'd like to quickly begin by thanking all of those who made today's event possible. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to the real person who planned the event, Zella Lin, who is the person in the history department who makes the trains run on time. Uh, so please. <laughs> the symposium was created to honor the memory of Alan Larkin, a member of the community of Boca Raton who loved history. His family thought that sponsoring this symposium would be a fitting tribute to his memory, and they hoped that their generosity would engage students and members of the community in the history of the presidency. And so I'd also like to thank them for making this event possible. Now, when I look at the audience today, uh, I have to imagine that the Larkin family is as pleased as I am to see so many students and teachers. Um, and it's very gratifying for me. You know, I, I'm a historian and I think a lot about dates, but it was only this morning as I was driving here that I did very simple math when I calculated that I was born the same year that the Pentagon Papers were released. <laughs> and it's sort of the, I'm growing and dawning on the realization of my life is, uh, I'm approaching the crisis. <laughs> but like for many, uh, like for me and for many of you, the Vietnam War really is history. Uh, and that's not true for everyone in this room, some who lived and suffered through a very long war. But for those of you who don't remember the war, I'm sure it evokes a lot of questions. And I'm sure you will be puzzled by some of the things you will hear today. And so I really want to encourage you to walk up to the microphones following the talk and ask your questions. And don't be afraid to ask really simple questions, questions that you might think are silly, like, why did we get into this war? Why didn't we win? What was it like? These aren't silly questions. These are the most important questions, and they're the ones we still need to think about. And not only do I invite our young people to come up and ask some questions, but I'd also like to encourage those of you who remember the war to share your, thought, your questions as well. But I'd also like to make a special plea that you encourage the young people around you to ask those questions. And if there should be a line at the mic, if you wouldn't mind extending an invitation to someone younger than yourself to invite them to come to the front, uh, take your place in line a little bit. Uh, because this is the generation that we really need to understand what happened in that long, dark, and revolutionary period in American life. Now, I've been organizing events like this for several years, several years and I've never seen so, many, so much interest and enthusiasm from students and teachers, and it's really gratifying to me. And I can't tell you also how thrilled I am personally by the interest that all of you have shown in Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. I'm also very pleased that the president of Florida Atlantic University asked to be with us here today. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite her to say a few words. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Jane Saunders. Thank you and good afternoon. There are moments in American history that are burned into our national consciousness because of what they say about us as the standard bearers of democracy in the world. Anyone who has a clear memory of the events of 1971 will have an instant reaction to the words Pentagon Papers. That was the year when a young government military analyst named David Daniel, <laughs> Daniel Ellsberg, who had an insider's knowledge of the pattern of high-level decision-making that got us into the Vietnam War, decided to risk his career by releasing more than 7,000 pages of classified documents to the news media. Over the course of four decades, Daniel Ellsberg has remained a committed, courageous, and articulate proponent of the people's right to know 
what their government is doing, especially about decisions to go to war. We are very fortunate to have the opportunity to hear him speak today, and I would like to reiterate Dr. Osgood's expression of deep appreciation to the Larkin family for their generous funding of this valuable discussion forum. It is now my pleasure to bring to the podium the man who will introduce Daniel Ellsberg, who is a Pentagon Papers expert in his own right. Dr. George Herring is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Kentucky. He has written numerous books on the Vietnam War and U.S. foreign relations, including the prize winning From Colony to Superpower. He has edited two collections of documents drawn from the Pentagon Papers. In addition to introducing Mr. Ellsberg, Dr. Heron will return to the stage later to take part in the moderated discussion that will follow Mr. Ellsberg's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George Heron. Thank you, President Saunders. I'm delighted to be back at Florida Atlantic. This is my second trip, and each time has been uh, a very enjoyable experience. I, I would like to begin, before I introduce Dan Ellsberg, I would like to share with you an item that I came upon, stumbled upon in USA Today this morning. Some of you may have seen it as well. That's quite pertinent to what we're talking about tonight. This was an announcement that the National Declassification Center of the National Archives is now working to declassify the full text of the Pentagon Papers, which lay out the government's history of U.S. involvement in Vietnam archives. It is also declassifying the documents on which the papers were based and investigative materials uh, related to the leak of the papers in 1971 by Dan Ellsberg. Quite an accomplishment, 40 years, and they're beginning to declassify. <laughs> Our speaker tonight was once branded the most dangerous man in America by no less than Henry Kissinger. To many others, he remains an American hero a card-carrying member of the policy-making elite who saw the errors of his ways and his country's ways, a man of great moral courage who risked imprisonment to end a war he believed both futile and wrong, a passionate and tireless crusader against government secrecy, war, and nuclear weapons. Daniel Ellsberg is a native of Chicago, he earned B.S. and Ph.D. degrees from Harvard. He served with distinction in the U.S. Marine Corps. The war in Vietnam touched him directly and changed him dramatically, as indeed it changed this country beyond recognition. His career intersected with the war in fascinating ways. He began, in his own words, a dedicated cold warrior. He started work in the Pentagon on the day of the 1964 Tonkin Gulf incident, of the event often believed to have triggered America's involvement in Vietnam. He subsequently served as a civilian with the pacification program in the Mekong Delta of South Vietnam, where he saw firsthand the horrific impact of the war on Vietnamese civilians. Returning to Washington, he helped to compile that 7,000-page document ordered by Secretary of Defense McNamara that became known as the Pentagon Papers. Along with many other Americans, Ellsberg went through a complete transformation on the war in the ornithological lexicon of the day from hawk to dove. He experienced it, in his own words, first as a problem, next as a stalemate, then as a moral and political disaster, a crime. In time persuaded that the war was based on lies, could not be won in any meaningful sense, and was doing irreparable harm to Vietnamese and Americans, he took part in anti-war protest. 
Ultimately, he set out to try to end the war by making public the top secret Pentagon Papers, thereby exposing the lies on which the war was based. A story I think those who were here yesterday afternoon will agree uh, was told with great dramatic effect in the film The Most Dangerous Man in America. When Ellsberg offered the papers to anti-war senator from Arkansas, J. William Fulbright, the senator questioned their importance in words that jar the ears of a historian like myself. Isn't it, after all, only history, Fulbright said? It was indeed only history, but it was the sort of history that could change, could and did change the way people looked at contemporary events. The papers were first printed by the New York Times in the summer of 1971, a time when this country was in turmoil over the Vietnam War. They did not bring the war to an immediate end, as Ellsberg had hoped. U.S. military involvement would continue until March 31st, 1973. The war would continue for another two years. But the release of these papers had an enormous impact. They confirmed that the United States government since the 1950s had repeatedly lied to the nation about what it was doing in Vietnam and the progress it was making. In doing so, they validated arguments offered by the anti-war movement for years, further undermining in that critical year already tenuous public and congressional support for the war. The Supreme Court's endorsement of publication of the papers by the Times and repudiation of the Nixon administration's effort to stop the presses became a landmark First Amendment case. And ironically, the administration's efforts to get Ellsberg, in Nixon's own choice phrase, set off a chain of events that would lead to the Watergate scandals and the demise of the Nixon presidency. A Nixon thus crippled and his successor, Gerald Ford, could therefore not continue the war, at least with air power, as Nixon had envisioned when he agreed to the uh, U.S. military withdrawal in 1973. The release of the Pentagon Papers is thus an event of great historical importance, one of the singular events of a tumultuous era. I am pleased and privileged to present to you this afternoon the man who made it happen, Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you very much. Listening to the uh, introduction by George, I was just reminded of what I just read uh, in the papers just yesterday. That the papers are going to be declassified at last, uh, showing that merely you know, now they're going to begin the process. At first I thought they're going to put them out, as I did 40 years ago. But no, it has to go through an interagency process. Uh, as they pointed out, we have processes for doing these. You say yes, and they had worked all too well to keep those secrets for a long time. So even though uh, these things were available almost entirely uh, have, for 40 years now, it's going to be a process. And I, I do hope, on my, my 80th birthday is coming up uh, on April 7th, and I do hope that I'll be alive when they finally do get declassified. Eventually it could be. <clears throat> in, other words, I hope, in other words, I hope to live a long time, actually, beyond this. Uh, now. I was just asked out there, well, what will people learn, let's say, uh, when, the, when the entire thing gets declassified? I would be, um, I would like to see people compare the complete version, the official version, with what the government did put out uh, at the time, a government printing office edition, which was, um, a GPO, which was um, heavily redacted. It had a lot of white space in it. Now, I'd already, at that point, put out uh, through Senator Gravel and through the newspapers, 
uh, nearly the entire, nearly the entire documents. So the information that they redacted was actually available anyway, but what was it that they really still thought should be kept after all that from the American people? And uh, this came into my head just as I was listening to the introduction just now. And I remember, for instance, one of the very first pieces of white space in the, uh, in the GPO edition, which I was perhaps first in line to get at the government printing office uh, when it came out. And that was a footnote from 1946, November of 1946, and this was uh, now 1971, just uh, 25 years later, and the war had five years to go. It became a 30-year war altogether. And that footnote actually had to do with the uh, first major act of violence in what we used to think of as the French War. Uh, that's the way we thought of it in, in, in American historians and so forth. It was usually described that uh, for a long period and perhaps to some descent still today. And it was certainly the way I thought of it uh, when I was in Vietnam from 1965 to 67, that we had come in after the end of the French War, after their defeat at Dien Bien Phu and uh, the Geneva Accords in 1954, and then we had come to replace the French as people lacking the stigma of imperialism, of colonization, uh, of the French oppression of Indochina, and indeed uh, we had many other wonderful characteristics that they lacked. For example, we all thought of the French as racist, which is why they had failed and why we had no, no problem, would have no problem over there. So, uh, but we'd had nothing to do with that, that earlier war. Okay, this footnote then had to do with the what amounted to the opening of the violent phase of the French Viet Minh War, the uh, under Ho Chi Minh communist-led nationalist struggle against French domination. It actually began when, after some provoked incidents between French and Vietnamese in the end of, uh, toward the end of 1946, after Ho Chi Minh had been received as a head of state negotiating with the French, for a referendum that would unify all of Vietnam, he hoped, uh, in, uh, in France and had been received, as I say, in those negotiations as a head of state at that point. Now, that all broke down with this act where uh, Admiral Dargonye decided to respond to these small skirmishes between the Viet Minh forces which uh, had declared independence of Vietnam at that point and had been appealing to the United States for support in the spirit of the Atlantic Charter, in the spirit of our own anti-imperialist past to support their moves for independence against the uh, French. And uh, the act began then with Dargonye shelling the port of Haiphong and the footnote reported what is the usual estimate of the effects of that shelling of Haiphong. 6,000 dead, 6,000 dead in a period of a day or two, or a couple of 9-11s in effect. Now, I did wonder at the time, this is now 1971, why is it so important to delete that early footnote, right, very early on in the papers, uh, from the American public, it has already been reported, but to um, anybody who reads this uh, shouldn't have their attention attracted to this attack on Haiphong. Let me move ahead a moment. Uh, I later had a clue as to why that might have been regarded as quite sensitive by the Nixon administration. Uh, Nixon had, from the beginning of his term, been interested in the mining of Haiphong as an accompaniment to the beginning renewal of total bombing of North Vietnam, which had been halted by Lyndon Johnson a year earlier before, uh, rather, in, I should say, by the end of 1968. And this was something that he actually did do in 1972, a year after the Pentagon Papers, uh, mining of Haiphong, not long before the bombing of Haiphong and Hanoi occurred, the heaviest bombing in human history, which again came after the election of 72, in which Henry Kissinger, in his first televised public statement said, peace is at hand, knowing that threats were being made and plans were being made for the heaviest bombing 
for a couple of weeks in human history to come in Haiphong and Hanoi. Now, maybe there was no connection between the people who were doing the declassification or classification and the policy. Maybe the people doing that really did not know what I actually did know at that point, which was why I'd copied the Pentagon Papers, that Haiphong was in the crosshairs of the Nixon administration, as was Hanoi, uh, as was a number of other things, dikes and so forth. But they didn't want to tr attract attention to how the war had started and what the human costs of that were. Actually, one of the big secrets of the Pentagon Papers was implied by the title, and it got various titles, uh, in the course of different drafts, they, as was done between 1967 and uh, 69, when it was finished. The main title that I recall, uh, you'll see slightly different versions, was U.S. Decision-Making in Vietnam, 1945 to 1967. Now, actually, the account went into Johnson's, ended with Johnson's decision not to run for re-election at the beginning of 68, in March of 68. So it went into 68. Uh, and in fact, uh, the belief at that time was that the war was essentially over, which is why the study ended. The people doing the study were still in office during 68, but they really thought the war is now going down. We're gonna negotiate, as Johnson had said, we'd do it anywhere. Uh, negotiate without conditions. People were a little surprised that it took months to decide on where the negotiations would take place after all and what the shape of the table would be, which sounds absurd, but would the NLF be represented? Would there be a four-sided table in which the National Liberation Front in the South would be president? I mean, anyway, all this went on. The negotiations were long delayed and the bombing continued in a uh, considerable part of North Vietnam until the fall. It was not the end of the war. So the people doing the study were mistaken to think that we could now end U.S. decision-making in Vietnam in 67. As I say, it had eight years to go, till 1975, uh, May 1st. But the surprising and more or less secret part, and the part that in the end had a very great effect on me, was the study began in 45. U.S. decision-making in Vietnam in 45? What were we deciding in 45? Well, we were deciding to support the French. Actually, Roosevelt uh, had been very critical of French colonial uh, domination. He had told his son and others uh, earlier during the war that the French have exploited that country for 70 years. They have mistreated it. They have. Uh, uh, people are, uh, there's less literacy than when they began 70 years ago, and uh, they haven't developed it at all. They, sh they really should be a trusteeship, they should not be in charge. But he changed his mind before he died. That change is usually attributed to, to Truman, but that's not actually correct. FDR had decided before he died in early 45 that for geopolitical reasons, for, this, for the uh, cooperation of the French in Europe, and especially to keep from worrying the British that we might not support their continued colonial domination of India and Malaysia and other places, uh, that we would, in fact, support French reconquest of Indochina. Actually, the French had been interned in Indochina by the Japanese. And um, as I say, in the end, they had to fight their way back into Indochina starting in particular with this shelling of Haiphong, which led to a move inland toward Hanoi. The Viet Minh cons uh, carried out more or less a scorched earth policy and evacuated Hanoi. And the French then occupied Hanoi and conducted their war, which ended in defeat finally, eight years later, um, having occupied Hanoi and Haiphong the entire time. So the point though that uh, was News to me, when I read the earliest parts of the Pentagon Papers in 69, it may confuse you with all these dates here, but I started on the, the papers when the study started in late 67. I had access to them uh, only in 69, uh, actually, when I got a full copy to do research at the, at the Rand Corporation. And I was the only person doing 
using the Pentagon Papers for research on lessons of Vietnam. The only person I was being paid on a government contract to learn lessons, or as I put it in, in uh, the study, lessons from failure in Vietnam. And it was not heresy by that time to make such a suggestion, but that's what the lessons would be. But uh, I put off reading the earliest parts of the study, there were 47 volumes, till very late in the game. I read everything else first. I didn't start at the beginning. Um, I myself had lived through, the in the Pentagon, the 64-65 period, the escalation in Vietnam under Lyndon Johnson. And uh, I'd been a, a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense. At the highest civil service level, I was really a glorified, highly paid clerk working for the Assistant Secretary, had no effect on decision making, although, as I say that, uh, oddly enough, uh, almost one of the, one of the, it might have been one, two, or three times when I was made aware that I had some influence, and that was a study I'd done for McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, uh, his request to my boss, the Assistant Secretary, a study of the effects of mining Haiphong, the port through which material came in from China and Soviet Union. And I had a team of intelligence operatives uh, working under me, analysts, I put it together and wrote the final thing, and c which concluded that mining Haiphong would have no effect on the conduct of the war. It would in involve distinct risks of w getting involved in shooting hostilities with the Soviet Union because at any given time they had various uh, ships in Haiphong, as did the Chinese. It would be hard uh, if fighting got came out over this mining. Would, in fact, a mine might blow up a Soviet ship, kill people. So there was a, a definite risk diplomatically and, and uh, of escalation there. In terms of actual effect on the war, uh, at that point, we're talking 65 now when I did this study, the conclusion was that the amount of materiel that the, uh, the communist-led forces were getting fr uh, from the Soviet Chinese, so Chinese and Soviet bloc amounted to about one to two truckloads a day. So that since there were innumerable waterways from China and railroads and roads, that mining Haiphong would have no effect, uh, absolutely no effect on the ability of this to get through. And the Joint Chiefs, uh, when confronted with this, they, they very much wanted to mine Haiphong from the very beginning. And um, uh, when you pointed this out to Joint Staff people, or the JCS, uh, they would say, well, all right, they could go through China, it could go uh, very well, uh, there'll be no effect, but it is going through Haiphong now, so we should mine Haiphong, that's where it should go. And the idea that it could move uh, did not impress them somehow. Anyway, this study actually did impress McNamara. He was about, he was in favor of before that, and he sent word through McNaughton that uh, thanked Dan uh, he really influenced my thinking on this one. It's almost the only time I can remember actually hearing that. And um, I don't usually talk about that. Why would I? But the, the, as you'll see, this theme, this Haiphong uh, notion does come up uh, and is in my mind just at the moment. Now, what I learned from reading finally the earliest portions of the Pentagon Papers just in the summer of 1969, two years after the start of the Pentagon Papers study, was that in fact U.S. decision making had not only been taking place but that we were in effect an active participant in the war from the very beginning. And one other thing, that we were well aware that in backing the French we were not only backing a, an effort by a colonial power to uh, reconquer a country that had declared its independence in the spirit of the Atlantic Charter, but that in accord with this, that was a, a highly popular movement in Vietnam. Uh, one of the documents I have here was, we are well aware that Ho Chi Minh is the most popular figure in Indochina, is backed by an enormous majority of the people. And therefore, we're in something of a quandary as to tell what they're French to do because we can't ask them to allow him to be part of a government since he is a communist. And yet to exclude him, as they say, is of questionable you know, legitimacy and so forth. 
a number of other cables to that effect, men, making clear in the cables we were well aware, or our president was made well aware, and there was really nothing to the contrary, that from 45 and 46 on, we were opposing nationalist independence of Indochina, and specifically of Vietnam. We were opposing the will of the majority of the people, violently, and we were, in doing so, uh, especially when it came after the fall of China and the fear of the Truman administration of being tarred with having lost Indochina to, to its own people, led by communists, in addition to having lost China on its borders, that we just couldn't allow that. And when the French were getting tired of the war and wanted really to get out of it and to cut losses, we did a great deal to keep them in, including paying 80% of the costs of the war. Uh, that was something I was certainly not aware of when I, in, in that period, let's see, uh, in 45, well, I was 14, I wasn't very aware of it, but growing up, I had never become aware of it, nor was I really aware of it in Vietnam. When I was a, uh, switched over to the State Department, I volunteered to go there with the same rank I'd had in the Pentagon, which was an FSR-1, Foreign Service Officer-1, the highest civil service rating there. I, I don't think I knew anyone in the embassy at that point. And two of the people that I knew very well were young political officers named Richard Holbrook, who just died, and uh, Frank Wisner, who just went over to Mubarak, having been ambassador in Egypt, so I, friends of mine at the time. I don't think that any of us were aware of this history that I'm describing and about to describe, which amounted to saying that the notion that this was a French war, uh, which we went along with as a French ally, was always false. As the Vietnamese understood it, as I came to learn after I'd been there, it was a French-American war or an American-French war against them, against their self-determination from the very beginning, which in effect doomed it from any real prospect of victory, uh, that we had no, we never had any more prospect of victory than the French had had, despite the fact that we had a lot more helicopters and the French had lost two world wars except for our intervention, this is the way we thought of it, and they were racist and we weren't, and they were colonialist and we weren't. So we were helpers, we were aid, we were supporters, we supported democracy. Actually, that had never been true. What this history indicated was we had always opposed democratic will and democratic self-determination in Vietnam. To be sure, uh, Ho Chi Minh, as a Stalinist uh, nationalist, was not likely, was almost certain not, to uh, allow a, what we would call a democratic regime in Vietnam. But independence from foreign affairs, which is what drew the support for him against colonialism, he did offer, and in the end, after his death, it was achieved. But to actually beat them, we had no more prospect of doing that than the French, unless, according to the Joint Chiefs, we went to a level of violence that was far beyond what we ever did do. Now, that wasn't tested. No president actually did give the orders that the Joint Chiefs had been recommending from very early on which by the 60s came to include a litany of escalations, most of which were never done, but included starting mining Haiphong, but also invading the North, hitting every target in the North more or less simultaneously up to the Chinese border. And both those points, the mining, the invasion, the hitting the targets next to the Chinese border, likely to bring in the Chinese as they recognized. In which case, as they recommended, we would have to use nuclear weapons. And no civilian ever, ever disagreed with that. No civilian in the top secret documents where this was discussed ever said, oh no, that we can't do. Uh, but anyway, that was clearly implied by what they wanted to do, which also included invading the quote sanctuaries in Laos and Cambodia, uh, expanding the war, in other words, and putting in between 500,000 and a million US troops in South Vietnam, 
In the end, we got up to 550,000, which was sort of the lower level of what the chiefs had said would be sufficient. But by that time, 68, they were well aware that it wasn't sufficient and were recommending 700,000 to a million. In fact, those figures were being mentioned as early as 65 when I was in the Pentagon. Now, the public was not being told this view of the chiefs, which included the judgment over and over again, you cannot succeed less than that. And what I've been saying is really to understand the nature of the struggle and who we were fighting, which the Joint Chiefs were not, just to put it nicely here, were not expert on, uh, nor was I at the time, of course. Um, their approach would not have won either, but it would have killed a lot more people. According to McNamara, we killed perhaps three to four million Vietnamese in the course of our struggle there altogether, the conflict. It could have been five or six, seven million. So it could have been much worse. One secret of the Pentagon Papers that they revealed unmistakably was that the chiefs had been regularly, consistently, without any exception, saying, you will not succeed uh, at levels that the president was actually authorizing. And without all the steps that he's authorizing, they did say, you will succeed if you do what we ask, which meant that every president was confronted with the possibility that if he didn't give them at least enough of what they asked, they might resign or they might go public, which actually they never did. This remained secret. They kept the secret. They did not leak what they were actually recommending, which was known to not just hundreds, but probably a thousand people inside the Pentagon, what they were ranking, I among them. And this was true from 64 on, before the real escalation had begun, after Kennedy had put advisors in, but before any combat units had gone. I knew that almost the first week I was in the Pentagon in August of 64. Hundreds, if not a thousand people had documents showing the same. What the JCS was asking for was essentially what Goldwater was proposing in the election of 64, one of the two main issues. Uh, the other having to do with the release of nuclear weapons, which Coldwater wanted to do, and use nuclear weapons in Vietnam and elsewhere. But the other one was just escalation in Vietnam, and the president was opposing that. On the first day I was in the Pentagon, uh, August 4th, by coincidence, the day of the Tonkin Gulf alleged second raid, which didn't take place on our attacks, but which we, quote, retaliated to, the president said, we seek no wider war, in contrast to Goldwater. During the campaign that went, uh, went along for that, he said, there were some who want us to go south, meaning get out, and actually there were some in the Pentagon, but they were, that was a big secret. Uh, I don't mean the Pentagon so much as in the government. And there were those who want us to go north. That was very public. Goldwater was running on that. And what people did not know was he was running on the, people regarded him as a nut for, for saying these things. He was defeated in what amounted to a referendum on those proposals in the election by the largest margin in American history. It was like a referendum on those proposals. Those were the proposals of the Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously. Only the Pentagon Papers really brought that out. The, the public had no clue. No reporter managed to, to become aware of that. And why didn't they leak it? Why didn't they just say? Well, because the president did manipulate them well enough. He never said he would never give them what they wanted, just not now, not yet, not all of it. And they were led to believe that if they were good soldiers and went along so far, the time would come when he would give, give them what they wanted. He would mine Haiphong, they would blow North Vietnam to pieces, as, as General LeMay, Chief of the Air Force, said, uh, pave it over, make it a parking lot, bomb it back, to, that was one of the phrases, bomb it back to the Stone Age, which is, I guess, not the same as a parking lot, but looks the same. And um, uh, they ran, on, say, on the, on the campaign, the public voted against it, and on the day of the election, I wasn't voting because I was with other uh, while the public was repudiating this approach as strongly as they could and consciously, I was in representing the Defense Department with my boss, 
from the Defense Department, in an interagency meeting at the State Department, considering alternative ways of carrying out the Goldwater strategy that the public was voting down. So we didn't have time to go out and vote. We were doing more important things there, which was uh, carrying out what, as I say, the public was totally against. In other words, our campaign against self-determination by the Vietnamese had a, shall we say, ironic counterpart in terms of self-determination by the American public, who were doing what they could, they thought, voting against that proposal, which they were about to get. In fact, I remember, uh, how many of you remember Mort Saul? I didn't see enough people here, okay. Uh, I remember he used to say, he, 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 his position was he claimed he had been, as a student, much more radical than uh, the liberal, his liberal friends. And uh, so he was, he was against Johnson, he said. And he said, my friends were all telling me, if you don't vote for Lyndon Johnson, we'll be bombing North Vietnam by, uh, in a few months. He said, they were right. I didn't vote for Lyndon Johnson, and we were bombing North Vietnam in a few months. Uh, very funny. But all of this was known to me at that time, that the public was being deceived on this. But after all, it wouldn't have occurred to me and didn't occur to me to do what Senator Morse, who voted against the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, against this open-ended uh, open uh, delegation to the president of the war powers, uh, he told me in 71, if you had given us what you just released in the Pentagon Papers, if you'd given us that when it was in your safe, I'm paraphrasing here, in 64, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution would never have gotten out of committee. He was on the committee, Foreign Relations Committee. And if they had bypassed the committee and brought it to the floor for a vote, it would not have passed. And really, what he was telling me was that I could have prevented the Tonkin Gulf Resolution which is probably true. But even that didn't impress me so much when I heard it because I thought, well, Johnson was so determined to expand the war at that point that he would have found another excuse other than the Pentagon Papers. And uh, he would have done it anyway, so it wouldn't have made that much difference. That was my reaction in 71. As I thought about it later, I realized, wait a minute, the Tonkin Gulf incident and, I would tell you, and, the, and the resolution, was my first week in the Pentagon. But week by week, day by day, for every day of the campaign, my safe was filling up with cables and memos and estimates and recommendations that took it for granted that we would be escalating right after the election, as we did, if not before. McNamara and the Joint Chiefs were recommending uh, that he seek another excuse to escalate, because we couldn't wait. Why not? Because the government in Vietnam, it was after the Ziem coup, after our support of the assassination of Ziem, President Ziem, was so corrupt, so illegitimate, a bunch of generals, crooked, corrupt generals who had been trained by the French and in virtually every case had fought against the independence of their country for the French as sergeants, lieutenants, before they became generals under our regime. And so that regime was so illegitimate and so lacking in support, it wasn't clear that it could be held together until the election. We had to really get right in there and, and take a combat role right away. And Johnson turned that down. Wait till after the election, in other words. That's what I was hearing through my boss, not yet. While he was telling the American public, we will not send American boys to do what Vietnamese boys should be doing, we will not go south, we will not bomb, we will not go south, we will not bomb the north, et cetera, et cetera. Stealing the elect, well, stealing a landslide. He would have won anyway, because if that had all come out, why vote for Goldwater? That's what he was proposing. But it wouldn't have been a landslide. It was an impeachable offense, but of course, with a Democratic Congress, there was no chance that he would be impeached for it. He was certainly violating his oath, as I was violating my oath, to uphold the Constitution, which calls for Congress to make the decision on war and peace. He was manipulating and lying to Congress, getting in there, totally ripping apart that constitutional constraint. But it didn't occur to me that my oath of office 
which called on me to support and defend the Constitution, not to obey a commander-in-chief, not to keep secrets. The president, the commander-in-chief, even the chain of command is not mentioned in that oath any more than the same oath as when I was a Marine lieutenant. Marine lieutenants have superior officers and they have a commander-in-chief, but it's not mentioned in their oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The Johnson administration, like the George W. Bush administration this, this century, were acting as domestic enemies of our Constitution at that point. And, and they weren't getting any resistance from me which I, I disapproved of what they were doing, not of the constitutional aspects. I knew nothing about that. I worked for the president. It didn't occur to me the Constitution applied to me, despite that oath of office. We were, we were president's men. But I did think that the policy was very, uh, very foolish and unwise, having been to Vietnam in 61 as a civilian and um, learned enough there to realize this was a loser. I was a cold warrior, but this was not the place to plant our flag. Uh, and again, not so much because it was unpopular, because we, in Vietnam, but because it was a loser. We weren't going to win there. I did see another reason for opposing the war, as I say, in the fall, in the summer of 1969, which was that the war that I had accepted as a general uh, notion that uh, along with most Americans, I really wanted us out of there by now. That was a coming to be a majority opinion by 69 and 70 and 71. In fact, Nixon had won a very close election by uh, promising to end the war honorably. That's how he won. And uh, at the beginning of 69, I assumed that he meant that. I wrote the first set of options on Vietnam for Nixon through Kissinger, directly for Kissinger. In December of 68, it was Kissinger's first presentation to the National Security Council. And I did that, uh, I, I accepted that job, despite my belief that extrication was the only valid option at that point, in order to make sure that that one got a strong presentation that somebody else might not give it, or somebody else wouldn't even include it, in fact. In fact, that option was dropped before it actually went to the National Security Council at the request of Kissinger because of the clear military. They didn't even want to have it discussed, extrication. So that particular option that I had drafted and written that I worked on uh, didn't even get to the National Security Council. Still, I thought, okay, he's just deferring to the military on that point. Uh, it doesn't mean he's not for it. But by the middle of 69, it had been leaked to me and I had a clearance at that point, but I wasn't supposed to have this information. In fact, the man who gave it to me was not supposed to know it. He worked for Kissinger, had Mort Halpern, but he had been shown information, top secret information, that he was not supposed to see. And he leaked it to me, which is normal in the system, to somebody who has the clearance, even though it's against the rules, that Nixon wasn't getting out. In fact, he was making threats of escalation in order to get this honorable end that he wanted, which would allow our influence in Vietnam, our bases, to remain indefinitely by keeping in power a pro-US dictator, Thieu, who had essentially no, well, maybe it's unfair to say that people who worked for the GVN, Catholics in particular, who 10% of the population, more or less supported him. Maybe he had 10% support, not, not more than that. We were supporting this dictator, uh, like Ziem before him, um, and expected to keep him there indefinitely, despite his corruption, his repression, the torture he used, his total fecklessness as a military commander, uh, because he let us keep our bases and he kept, let us hold on to Saigon. And it was basically we could avoid the charge of having lost Vietnam. In order to do that, Nixon was threatening the North, I learned in 69. And most people don't know this to this day. 
with a massive escalation of the war, including, well, including uh, going into possibly North Vietnam, definitely going into the sanctuaries in Laos and Cambodia, uh, not putting in more troops, that was not in the cards by that time, by 69, renewing the bombing of North Vietnam on a larger scale than it had ever been conducted, hitting the dikes, which we estimated, Kissinger estimated, killing hundreds of thousands of people by drowning, or using nuclear weapons. On the tapes, in, as three years later, in 72, uh, Nixon is heard saying to, I've heard this to, to Kissinger, um, uh, I'd rather, you know, the dikes, how many would that kill? Kissinger says, I think it was 200,000 or something. Nixon says, no, 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 no. I, I'd rather use the nuclear weapon. And Kissinger, very matter of fact, very low key, not <laughs> so far, no, just rather use the nuclear weapon, which had been in the cards for Nixon, not for me. I had not included that in the options, and it wasn't formally in the options. I said, somebody said, should we put in nuclear threats? And so I said, any mention of nuclear threats in Vietnam is a piece of paper I will not be associated with at all. Get somebody else that's not going to be there. So it wasn't. But Nixon and Kissinger were considering it and made those threats as early as the fall of 69, which I was not aware of at the time. Uh, let me sum this up. By 69, I was aware then of two things which, one of which was in the Pentagon Papers and one implied but not proven by the Pentagon Papers. First, uh, that the United States had been consciously opposing self-determination. Let's not say democracy because Ho Chi Minh or, or his people were not offering the, American, the Vietnamese people democracy in our sense any more than our dictators were. No big distinction between the two, both sides, political prisoners, torture, whatnot. Uh, we weren't offering any democracy either at all. To be sure, there were elections. In fact, my boss in Vietnam, Ed Lansdale, a former CIA agent, when he was a CIA agent, he had advised Ziem to uh, hold a referendum and, and get himself elected as head of a republic. And he, the way he told it to me was, he said, I explained to him that, uh, let's say, a 60% vote in favor would be very good, you know, look free and open and a good, solid majority. He said, but no. No, 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 he had to have 104%, uh, which is, uh, that sounds like a joke. He actually got 99%, I think, but he got that by 104% in the Saigon area that he controlled to compensate for lower accounts uh, late, earlier. Not, uh, that's true right now of elections held in our various other satrapies in uh, the former Soviet Union, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. They typically get 99% of the vote. And of course, one of the things in Egypt just now that really infuriated people was that the Muslim Brotherhood, which had participated in recent elections, I'm, I'm sorry, in elections in 2005 and gotten 20% of the parliamentary uh, representation, somehow magically got zero in the latest election uh, under Mubarak. And that looked phony uh, to people, which is why a demand in the last week was that parliament, a demand by the democracy people was that parliament be dissolved. And that's one of the demands that the army met to great applause, dissolve the parliament. Is that democratic? Well, it had been so clearly uh, fraudulent, as is true in Afghanistan, of course, where we have an elected president and clearly fraudulent elections and so forth. So the first point was something that at that point I thought was an aberration of US policy, not the policy I'd come into the government to support or participate in, which I thought, as most Americans probably do think to this day, that we encourage, favor, support, desire democracy throughout the world. We encourage it everywhere, we prefer it, and where we do work with dictators, as in China, or uh, various other places of our allies, like Egypt, it's very reluctantly because they're there, it's not our business, we have to deal with who's there and so forth. 
That was my understanding in the government in Vietnam as well, though I knew it to be false in Vietnam. And what I now learned was that it had been consciously false in Vietnam since 45. We had consciously opposed an expression, a free expression of public desire in Vietnam, which was for two things very at the top. Unification of Vietnam after 54 when we divided it by US policy, basically. Unification and independence of foreign control. Independence, uh, particularly, and some other things they had in mind. Land reform was popular and so forth. We had ambivalent feelings about that. We opposed those two things, and that meant we could not allow a free expression. Just as in Egypt, I'm, uh, I believe, uh, bring this right up to the present, uh, the WikiLeaks cables show the people of the area that the US was well aware that our dictator, or the dictator, uh, mainly supported by the French, but also by us in Tunisia, was corrupt to the point of being a kleptocrat. He's accused of having his family of having $50 billion uh, uh, salted away in Swiss banks, which have now uh, frozen. Well, that's exactly what we knew that. We knew that the public knew it and that he was extremely unpopular and also very repressive and tortured, put in dissidents in jail and so forth. Indeed, uh, those cables have led to a lot of credit for our diplomats for their acute, realistic reporting, not to the public, but to the, uh, to the president. So we did know, but there's another side to that. That means that the president was being told we knew uh, how uh, corrupt and how unpopular, how illegitimate these governments were, Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, uh, other places. And we supported them. Now again, was this reluctant? I knew that in Vietnam, it was not. That was our policy. We wanted to prevent an expression of popular will in a number of respects. And to that effect, we supported the rich, we supported the military, we supported the thieves, basically, and the torturers by our choice. And had they not carried out the repression that they did, we would have, or had they allowed a coalition government, had they allowed an election in which people calling for peace, even at the cost of a communist victory of some, uh, politically, had to be excluded. We would not allow that. Had they done otherwise, they knew they could be assassinated like Ziem and his brother, who at the time they were killed in 63, we knew, were exploring, negotiating with the communists, with the NLF at that point. That's another side of the 63 story. Very much in the minds of the Vietnamese ever since. If we get a, uh, against US policy here and allow the war to end, we're out. At best, we'll be paid off, as various others were, General T and some others, paid off to leave, General Men. At worst, we'll be killed. So that can't happen. The other side was that uh, our knowledge in the case of a war, as in Vietnam, or I would say right now, as in Afghanistan, as shown by the WikiLeaks cables on Afghanistan, of our people in the field are well aware that we are not winning and we're not about to win, and that as the Eikenberry cables that were leaked a year ago, after the president's uh, decision were leaked, show the President Obama's escalation was, in the words of Richard Holbrook, my old colleague from Vietnam, now, at, before he died, the Afghan-Pakistan ambassador, special ambassador. His words quoted by Bob Woodward in a top secret statement that got to Woodward one way or another, it can't work. What the president is doing, it can't work. We didn't hear that from Holbrook at the time, needless to say, or anybody else. Biden was saying the same, the vice president, just as Hubert Humphrey was saying to Lyndon Johnson, the same thing. Others, military, were saying, can't work. What McChrystal is asking, what Petraeus is asking, cannot succeed. We didn't hear that. So um, here's what it comes down to. What I had learned after the Pentagon Papers, after Vietnam, was that Vietnam 
in that respect was not an aberration. It was very frequent throughout the third world. In fact, the following generalization, which may sound to some of you young or old, both unfamiliar, radical, extremist, uh, can't be true, certainly unfamiliar. I'll just say it, it's my conclusion after 40 years of studying this in the light of my experience in Vietnam. The United States government is commonly and typically as a norm skeptical of and on the whole opposed to democracy in the third world, in the former colonized areas, in the uh, so-called the underdeveloped parts of the quote free world. The number of aberrations when it comes to uh, you could say Brazil, Chile, Indonesia, uh, Iran at the time of Mossadegh um, or of the Shah and uh, uh, I give a, a very long list, like Vietnam, represent the U.S. view that a popular government, a populist government, as we put it, would be deleterious to American interests, which have various forms, bases, military involvement, very definitely corporate interests of various kinds, uh, imposing IMF, World Bank austerity spheres, very hard for a popular government to do since they immiserate a large part of the population. Um, or uh, uh, allowing unions, particularly. Uh, I could add, by the way, Guatemala and uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador to this list. Allowing unions, allowing farmers, uh, cooperatives of various kinds, that would reduce profits of American multinational corporations. Or possibly failing to give in the Middle East our oil corporations privileged access and profits from the oil of that area or a control of the oil. Various motives you could go into, but the bottom line is, or a bottom line, is typically the dictatorships among our pro-US allies, our pro-US dictatorships, are there not because, I, I say, not just me, are there not because the US reluctantly accepts them but because it is U.S. policy that they are preferable to any more popular alternative. And therefore, Obama's puzzling to many people reluctance to come out against Mubarak's continued stay, which was attributed, well, he's been our ally for quite a while and we can't just desert him and whatnot. It's part of the truth, but misleading. Mubarak has represented with all of his repression and indeed his corruption, which is okay with us, as in all the other cases, represents exactly what we wanted from Egypt in preference to what may be coming. Whether, and of course that's painted in very lurid terms, an Islamic Sharia state, caliphate, uh, a new Iran, and so forth, possible. Possible. Our own intelligence agencies, it's so far has been leaked so far, say that's possible and not very likely, or under current circumstances. They didn't foresee this coming. But under the last two weeks, it's very clear there are forces at work there which are rather different from the Muslims we've been hearing about uninterruptedly for 10 years who hate us because of our freedoms and our democracy and who reject the idea of democracy and freedom. Anybody here heard that attributed to Muslims in general? Well, actually, let me see hands. How many people have heard that suggestion? Now, that seems to me not enough. How many people have not heard it? That seems more realistic. I think you've all heard it, <laughs> one way or the other. That's all we've heard. Is that what we saw on the television, the people in? Tahrir Square right now, people who hated democracy, hated freedoms, uh, wanted a repressive authoritarian government, wanted a strong man and so forth. Not quite. How many of those Egyptians, without amazingly enough being very anti-American it seems, how many of them are unaware that Mubarak has had American support? All this period. They're aware of it entirely. How many Americans are really aware of it? I just noticed that the uh, we've given them uh, over $60 billion in aid, mostly military, over the last 30 years. 
that corresponds interestingly to the $70 billion that are, is attributed to Mubarak's personal wealth at this time. Interest, an interesting coincidence, I guess. Uh, but it certainly is related to his having been there all this time. Another, so the US then, I'm sorry to say, uh, has been very commonly against uh, democracy. I believe from, on the basis of that understanding that the dominant view in Obama's administration, apparently there was a considerable split on this issue, but as usual, the dominant view, uh, which didn't totally prevail, was let's try to keep Mubarak there, at least as a figurehead. People, as I say, find that puzzling. Well, look more into the policy elsewhere and see how untrue that would be. Where is our position on Bahrain and, uh, and uh, Tehran and um, uh, Yemen right now, the protests that are going on now? We're appealing, as we did to Mubarak, to the rulers, the dictators, the torturers, the thieves, to reform so that they won't be kicked out, so that we won't lose our bases, so we won't lose our relationship. In Iran, uh, a little different. We're calling on the people to rise to the streets. Different, different attitude. In other words, democracy where it serves our purposes in the, in the short run, not elsewhere. That could change, but it would take a lot to change it. That's a very deep-rooted U.S. stance. And how, how could a change come to that, possibly come about? The Pentagon Papers read carefully, did show that the, pres that the American administrations, Democratic and Republic, can keep secrets very well. The fact that the Joint Chiefs had been recommending um, uh, escalation for 10 years, uh, heavy, 15 years really, since 61, before the end of the war, and that this had been very well kept, uh, came out with the Pentagon Papers, the fact that we had consciously been opposing popular movement in Vietnam uh, came out with the Pentagon. That had been kept very well for me and when I was in the government, even when I was in Vietnam. I didn't understand it. Uh, that I was not just following in the footsteps of the French, we had been shoulder to shoulder or actually pushing the French 80% of the cost of the war from the beginning, earlier on. In other words, the war, as I saw it as an American patriot, who believed in American ideals and the ideals of the American Revolution and the Bill of Rights, our effort had been illegitimate from the beginning. Now, a difference in Egypt, and that was true for 30 years, not just for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, that was the length of the war. Mubarak's been in power till he left, 30 years. And he's been there with our support and illegitimacy uh, and uh, our support, and he's been illegitimate, been adjourned for 30 years. And we've supported him to the hilt, and would be supporting him now, actually, under if, if, if without the popular resistance being as determined and nonviolent as it has been. And I'll, I'll end with, uh, with one last theme that I drew not from the Pentagon Papers, but from what else I was learning during that period. In starting really in 68, meeting a, a woman from India who had the follower of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, I had been reading uh, literature on nonviolence. And I have to say, this is something, in a way, I'm starting this too late. Maybe we'll get into it in the discussion a little. I feel, I felt for some time that I've been derelict for most of this period for talking so little about that influence. I've almost never used the word Gandhi in the days of the anti-war movement or since because it sounded exotic, possibly like a cult of some kind, uh, and uh, just not American somehow, despite the influence that Gandhi had on Martin Luther King, which was, I learned, very direct. I talked a little more about Martin Luther King, who did influence me when I read his writings, and Rosa Parks. But what I read from Martin Luther King was the effect of Gandhi's writings on him and also of Thoreau, uh, Henry David Thoreau, who went to jail to protest the Mexican War, particularly which was a clear-cut case, news to me in recent years, of aggression. 
in the words of Ulysses S. Grant, who was a lieutenant during the war and who later said uh, his greatest shame was that he had not resigned his commission in the face of what he said was an unjust war, as unjust as any uh, conducted for the aggrandizement of the, American, of the uh, European monarchies. He said it was a wrong war from the beginning, et cetera. I, I knew nothing of this. I don't know how many of you know about it. I've studied it some point similar since. But anyway, Thoreau uh, was uh, an influence on Gandhi. One of the first things Gandhi did was to translate in India Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience into Gujarati and to, uh, to uh, distribute it. And so I read Thoreau at that point. And what I read actually was, and I brought this out for the quote. He, uh, in, in uh, talking about the Mexican War, let's see if I find this. Well, can't find it. Uh, his point was that, uh, or the statement in the, uh, yeah, here it is. He says, withdrawal, what he was calling for was withdrawal from cooperation from an unjust government, especially one conducting an unjust war. He said, uh, you might or might not be justified in using violence in, in revo revolutionizing against taxes, as in the Tea Party or the early efforts of the Vietnam War. He said, you could live with those, he said. But when one country is invading another unjustly, and it is our own country doing it, then he said, it is not too soon to revolutionize and to, to go to jail to oppose that. He said, a soldier who refuses to serve in an unjust war, he said in Massachusetts, there had been some, was not imitated out of the thousands who are in opinion opposed to slavery and to the war, who yet in effect do nothing to put an end to them. They hesitate and they regret and sometimes they petition, but they do nothing in earnest and with effect. They will wait well disposed for others to remedy the evil, that they may no longer have it to regret anymore. At most, they give only a cheap vote. And what Thoreau said, which, as I say, Gandhi translated for his Indian compatriots. Gandhi said, cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. A minority is powerless while it conforms to the majority. It is not even a minority then, but it is irresistible when it clogs by its whole weight. Irresistible? Seems grandiose, you know, or uh, look at what we have just seen. The people in Egypt, in what Biden refuses to call a dictatorship until perhaps now, but a week ago, did cast a vote, a paper vote last year, and what they saw was it had no meaning. People cast a vote in 64 against the Vietnam War. It had no more influence than a vote against Russia's invasion of Afghanistan would have had later, or Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. The American people at that point had, were showing no influence against their policy, whether it was a Democrat or a Republican. Likewise, Iraq and so forth. Is doing more than that, does it have a possibility to affect and empire's policies affect the US even? Frankly, I'll tell you, when people have asked me, what are we to do now? Over the last year, I have found it so hard to answer that with any genuine optimism or encouragement that I've told my wife even, I said, I'm not sure I can bring myself to, to talk to people and face that question at this point. In 2006, I knew what to tell them Get Democrats in, at least. That will perhaps make a difference. And I'd said in 2004, done the same in 2004, but then we didn't get a Democrat. Uh, in 2007, how is it possible to say that? I said, get John Conyers as the, uh, as the head of the Judiciary Committee, uh, as he did become. He had just written a book on impeachment, showing that 
George W. Bush had committed more offenses against the Constitution than any previous president and was absolutely worthy of impeachment. And he wrote a book on that. But he was told, what did it do for us? Nothing. I understand from his aides, he was told by Nancy Pelosi when he took that chairmanship, there will be no hearings on impeachment because they didn't want to get in the way and bring people to the polls in 2008. So we get a Democratic president in 2008. Um, that was the idea. And John Conyers told me himself, he said, I didn't want to be accused of being the man who had riled up the Republicans to such an extent that they all went to the polls and they failed to elect a president who turned out to be a, a black president that would all the worse for John Conyers. I didn't want to bear that burden. So nothing, nothing on that from Conyers or on anything else, on the torture, on the uh, detention, on the uh, NSA wiretaps, totally illegal, blatantly illegal. But anyway, to elect a Democrat, let's be quiet about that, be silent, although their constitution was being ripped up in front of us. So then in 2008, I knew what people, I was, I was, I was uh, quite upset uh, by the lack of any, anything from the Democratic Congress in 2007, 2008. I remember saying to Mike Gravel, who had put the Pentagon Papers in the, in the uh, congressional record at the risk of his career, and I said to him, Mike, do you find this current Congress extraordinarily cowardly? He said, no, 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 ordinarily cowardly. And he said, they were, they were just the same, you know, before. Okay, so 2008, I knew what to tell people. Don't elect McCain, you know, back, whether it's Hillary, whether it's, uh, who was, neither of these were my candidate, actually, I backed Kucinich because of what he was saying, not with the belief. Kucinich was, was speaking for me, he wasn't going to uh, be elected, but got 1%, but he was uh, at least expressing uh, the, the policy views that I agreed with. And then, of course, when Obama was nominated, worked for him, not tremendously, but uh, fundraising and working so forth, very important. And it was important, of course. It was important not to elect uh, McCain Palin and this. And what did that do for us on Afghanistan? What the WikiLeaks cables show is an almost lack of any distinction in our foreign policy cables or in Iraq or Afghanistan from 2008 under Bush and 2009 and 10 under Obama. Torture continuing with, uh, uh, in Iraq on a vast scale by our Iraqi allies with our knowledge turning over people to be tortured in Iraq, which is as much of a criminal act under international law and domestic law as to doing the torture ourselves, which we may or may not still be doing. But if we're not doing it, it's just as much a violation of law to be turning those people over, knowing that they are going to be tortured in ways I don't, won't take the time to spell out here, by Obama, uh, as before. His statement, we do not torture, I've ended torture, is false, false, actually. Uh, to show that the uh, civilian casualties are being inflicted in Iraq, in Afghanistan, as before. As I say, the Eikenberry cables showing that Obama, for I think the same reasons as Johnson, going along with the best judgment of his civilian advisors and his military advisors in the National Security Council and uh, Jim Jones, General Jim Jones, General Lute, his czar for Afghanistan and Pakistan, opposing McChrystal and Petraeus in escalation on Vietnam, Holbrook saying it can't work. Why did he go ahead? Because he didn't believe them? I think not. I think because he didn't want Petraeus or McChrystal resigning, as they might have done and were threatening to do, and telling the country this man is weak, he's indecisive, he's uh, cowardly, he's not manly, may not even be American, and he's, um, uh, he was not, he's uh, willing to lose a winnable war. Is the war winnable? No, absolutely not. Petraeus and McChrystal think that, they're fools. I don't know whether they really think it or not, but they say it, and uh, they're prepared to oppose him, they were prepared to oppose him. Uh, if he didn't say it, Petraeus could still run, actually, for president in 2012. Apparently he's leaving as commander by the end of the year. That was just announced yesterday. And I, I believe Obama did not want to face that any more than Lyndon Johnson wanted to face it in 65. So the same politics are at work here. How to stop it? 
the, as I said, I, I saw almost no hope on the question of secrecy. A man who came in promising transparency has, is now prosecuting almost twice as many people in the last two years for leaks as all previous presidents put together. It's a small number because in America, because of the First Amendment and our revolution, we don't have a British type Official Secrets Act, which clearly criminalizes all release of classified information. Some types, nuclear weapons data, uh, communications intelligence are criminalized. But the broad things that are in the WikiLeaks or the Pentagon Papers, we don't have a criminal law intended to do that. Almost nobody knows that. Such a law was passed in 2000 for the first time, and Clinton, under pressure from a lot of newspapers at the last minute, vetoed it, referring to the Pentagon Papers case and opinions. Bush would not have vetoed it. Actually, Obama will not veto it if it comes to him, and it may very well come to him. But we don't have that law right now. So they're making do with, to prosecute Bradley Manning and four others right now, the same law that was used against me. <clears throat> I was the first to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act, the first to be prosecuted for giving information to the American public. And two others before Obama were prosecuted, only two. Obama's prosecuting five so far and Assange, of course, being considered. The charges against Bradley Manning include that charge, the Espionage Act. He's the private sitting in jail in Quantico now in conditions that are regarded, they're not unique, as highly inhumane in solitary confinement for the last seven months, uh, totally confined to a cell, 23 hours a day, uh, interrupted every five minutes on, on trumped up prevention of injury charges so to keep him from sleeping, keep him from doing anything, forbidden to have any exercise in his cell, given one hour a day to walk figure eights in a closed room, not to get outside for seven months. A UN rapporteur uh, for torture is investigating whether this does not constitute torture, as many reports say that it does, and it applies to a lot of people in solitary confinement in this country. Uh, but uh, in this case, clearly meant to break him down to testify against Julian Assange, that he conspired with him uh, in a way that the Times conspired with me, for example, in putting out the Pentagon Papers. They weren't charge. Okay, people in Congress have been calling for Bradley Manning to be executed. Now, the charges being brought against him do not allow for execution. Uh, he would have to be tried for treason, and of course they're very quick to call him a traitor and a terrorist who deserves execution. If he weren't in custody, they would be calling for him to be, to be executed extra-legally as members of Congress have called for Julian Assange. Uh, also called him a traitor, though he's not an American citizen, but called on him as a terrorist. Biden called him a high-tech terrorist, Julian Assange. Okay. Assange and Bradley Manning are no more terrorists or traitors than I am, and they're not, and I'm not, and I'm not. If he were, if he were uh, executed, if they changed the charges to, to treason, which is not impossible, people are calling for it. Uh, Dianne Feinstein, for one, on the Senate Intelligence Committee, my, my senator. Uh, if he were to be executed, I mentioned recently, but to no recognition, you'll see why it's kind of interesting, that he would be the first American to be executed for giving information to Americans since Nathan Hale. Now, how many people here, I, I found that I got no response to that. I thought maybe I committed a gaffe that, to mention such a patriot. How many people here do not know who Nathan Hale was, honestly? Can I see hands? Well, I was told, how many do know? Okay, it's a, a lot of people unsure whether you know or not. Okay, Nathan Hale, I found, is not known to most young Americans now. That's what I found since, since that dead response. I thought every American schoolchild knew the man, the American spy for George Washington, who at 21 was captured by the British and hanged as a traitor and spy. A traitor to King George III, 
like every member of the Declaration of Independence and the, and the Constitution, regarded as traitors, all subject to hanging, for having been loyal to George III in 1774 and having found a different loyalty to a different set of principles without a king in 1775 and 76. Hale, several of them, by the way, were hanged for it. Uh, I, I didn't know that till recently. Were caught by the British and hanged. But as a spy, uh, same kind of charges, you know, the Espionage Act. Hale, at 21, was hanged and went to the scaffold, put it over a tree, uh, a noose over a tree, and said, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country. How many have heard that, that quote? Everybody's heard that. Okay. What, he has a statue, by the way, in front of the CIA building now as the uh, first American spy. He's, he's uh, in that spy there in favor of also a statue at Yale when he went to college. Bradley Manning said, I am ready to, the person who turned him in, I'm ready to go to prison for life or even be executed to put out this information. What he had discovered was that he was turning people over to be tortured by the Iraqis who were guilty of nothing more than criticizing the corruption of our Iraqi government, our US supported Iraqi government. For that they were being tortured by the Iraqis. And when he reported this to his intelligence superior, they said, forget about that, get more suspects, that's our job. As he said, and especially later, when he, re when he saw the video of the 18 civilians in Baghdad being gunned down from a helicopter gunship, he said, I was actively participating in something I was totally against. The challenge he faces us is that, by the way, I think uh, as a military man who clearly violated military regulations, he's quite likely to go to jail for a very long time, could well be for life. That's what I was faced with. When I read that, I thought, I haven't heard that for 40 years, somebody who had the same mood I was in 40 years ago, that this was worth going to jail for life. But the challenge he poses is, uh, for what would you do that? For what would you risk your own career? For what is it worth? I'm not saying you, you, you. I'm saying one. The question I had to ask myself, what and what could I do if I were, now that I am willing to take that risk? What can I do? It was a new question for me. Imagine, for instance, a congressperson saying, what could I do beyond a vote, a strip of paper merely, it's not paper anymore, between pressing a button, if I were willing to risk re-election? What, what could Obama do if he asked himself, what could I, people say he's doing the best he can. Well, as he sees it, that's probably true. But is he seeing it quite as broadly as he might or he should? Has he asked himself the question? Let me guess not. What could I do if I were willing to sacrifice large scale campaign contributions in 2012? What could I do if I were willing to take that risk of not being reelected? What could I do if I were willing to accept the certainty that I will be called traitor and weakling and this, this, and that, as he will be, as he is anyway, actually. But if it were being put not just on Fox News, but just generally in Congress and so forth, what could I do then? It was the question I asked myself. What could I do if I'm willing to go to jail, lose my clearance, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that's an uncommon question. And I haven't seen anybody act as if they'd asked themselves that for 40 years until Bradley Manning, who, like Nathan Hale, clearly decided that he had one life of freedom to give for his country and that it was worth giving it, as he well may. What we've just seen is millions of people of kind that we have remained ignorant because we have crossed them off on, on suggestion of our leaders for decades now as ragheads, Muslim fanatics who wanted nothing more than to stone adulterers and had no interest in uh, any kind of democracy or anything that we understood as freedom. 
uh, people who had no reason to see us as part of their oppressors, et cetera, et cetera. Not our problem. And people we could not communicate with. And all of a sudden, find them that uh, they are, in fact, risking their bodies, their lives, their sacred honor, as our, as our founders put it, in order to oppose what they call Pharaoh, with their tradition, our Pharaoh, but could otherwise be called more modern terms, dictator or monarch. Biden said, I wouldn't refer to him as a dictator because we like his foreign policy. How about uh, Pharaoh? How about uh, monarch? Absolute monarch. By the way, what they are currently demonstrating for in Yemen, our Yemen, I'm sorry, in Bahrain, in Bahrain, our Bahrain, if I remember correctly, it was Bahrain that supplied a lot of the money to Reagan to carry out the terrorist contra war in Nicaragua after Congress had forbidden the use of U.S. funds or the spending of any funds not appropriated by Congress. I mean, did anybody remember? It wasn't Bahrain, was, along with Saudi Arabia, was one of the ones who supplied that lack unconstitutionally against the will of Congress for Reagan to carry out the terrorist war. In, uh, in Reagan, but maybe I'm wrong about that. But anyway, yeah, what they are uh, protesting now in Bahrain, our Bahrain, <laughs> where we have a base, it's the base of the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, is a retreat from absolute monarchy to parliamentary monarchy. That could change, conceivably. People in Iran right now are doing something that, as you know, couldn't be more heretical and more dangerous and more subversive. Now, they are actually openly calling for the downfall of Khamenei and Khatami and the other Ayatollahs, which has, you know, for a generation has been absolutely uh, unthinkable and strongly punished and tortured in Iran. In other words, things are getting out of hand. Our priorities, I'll close, in spending more than $100 billion a year in Afghanistan uh, to support a corrupt, dope-dealing regime with no popular support because it serves our interests in a country where most of the people want Americans out, not all, but most, of where we're spending $100 billion a year at a time when we're cutting emergency heating funds because of our deficit. This is a country where priorities are really quite seriously uh, out of whack. They're about, I would say, I'm looking for a quote here. They're, the difference between that and our policy in Iraq where, I'll just say briefly, where I think that the president is being as deceptive as Lyndon Johnson ever was, the impression he's consciously given that we are going to be totally out of Iraq and totally, uh, by the end of this year, or a little later, and totally out of Afghanistan as soon as possible, I think is consciously false. I believe that he intends to stay there in bases as long as possible, but the public just of those areas just might possibly not allow him to do that. So what can we do about it? I'm not saying we should overthrow our form of government. I'm saying we should get back to the form of government we had in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and that it is going to take conscientious action, unified action, association, and courageous action by officials, by media, by judges, by congresspersons, and by all of us here. It is not going to happen, that change in priorities, without courageous, more courage than we've seen of the kind we are seeing. I said that in 2007, or last year, I, I really found it very hard to express hope about climate change or about change in our foreign policy, about change in our domestic policy, where, by the way, by any major standard of inequality, the U.S. has more inequality of wealth and income than Egypt right now. And that's pretty far down on the scale. Uh, so right now, then, I just noticed uh, in, the, in the green room here, I happened to look at my, my book here and I opened to the following quote of 
February 1971, during the invasion of Laos. Um, I'd copied the Pentagon Papers, but they hadn't come out yet. And I wrote an article in the um, New York Review of Books uh, called Murder in Laos, because what I had concluded from my reading of the Pentagon Papers, 60 seconds more here, what I'd concluded was that to carry on a war against the will of the local people in their country, as we are doing in Afghanistan, and as we are continuing to keep bases in Iraq, I think, and as we are doing in Pakistan, for our interests, not that it really serves our interests, it probably recruits for Al-Qaeda, but in terms of what the president perceives as our interests, and specifically his interests of getting reelected, of not repelling the generals, et cetera, et cetera, that that was unjustified homicide. An unjustified homicide to me is murder. Is murder. Unjustified homicide. And murder to me was something that it was incumbent on me to go beyond what I'd been doing up till then, which was advising people on options, as I did Henry Kissinger and Nixon, and alternatives and letters to the editor, which I had done uh, earlier, uh, six months earlier, that it was incumbent on me to do what Bradley Manning has just done, and what I think others in the Middle East might well do, institute glasnost, as Gorbachev put it, greater transparency, really, even at risk to their careers or their lives. And I found that that article, at the end of February 1971, 40 years ago, concluded with this paragraph. Americans must look past options, briefings, pros and cons, to see what is being done <clears throat> in their name and to refuse to be accomplices. They must recognize and force the Congress and President to act upon <clears throat> the moral proposition underlined that the U.S. must stop killing people in Indochina, that neither the lives we have lost nor the lives we have taken given the U.S. give the U.S. any right to determine by fire and air power who shall govern and who shall die in Vietnam, Cambodia, or Laos. That war had four years to go. I was put on trial a few months later, facing 115 years in prison. But the war continued despite that and despite the Pentagon Papers. But that paragraph, I just read it, that paragraph applies absolutely right now and replaced the names Vietnam, Cambodia, or Laos to Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, or our dictatorships, our friendly dictatorships in uh, Egypt, so far, uh, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, uh, and other places. And it's up to us, I think, to show the courage that was shown by thousands and thousands of people in the anti-Vietnam War to do what they could non-violently and truthfully to end those crimes. A few used violence. They helped Nixon, as he was very consciously aware, to continue the war. If the people in the square had used violence against the troops and against the troops, Mubarak would still be there and his son would succeed him. And they understood that. So we can learn what I learned 40 years ago, and I wish I'd passed it on more, in the, in the subsequent years, we learned that nonviolence is more effective, can work at risk, it takes courage, but it can be effective, and that is the inspiration for us. Thank you very much. change, I'm just going to have you field questions as soon as things go. Okay. I'm just going to have you field questions instead of moving over here. Okay. Would you prefer a handheld mic? Sure. What? Would you prefer a handheld mic? Yeah, that'd be good. So we're now going to uh, welcome your questions, uh, but we're going to do a slight change in how we had planned. We had planned on, on sort of organizing a, a conversation up here, but I'm going I'm to return the mic to our, our, our speaker today and have him field questions directly. I would encourage you to come up. There's mics in the, on, in the front. Uh, and again, I would 
especially encourage young people to come up and raise their questions. Thank you again. Let's, let's give a moment, let people uh, leave and then before you do that. Hmm? If you feel like getting off your feet, you're welcome to also sit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Maddox, yeah, right. Well, that's, that, the next shot must have ruined that. Oh, yeah, well, there was an attack. Uh, that was the day there was an attack. Well, yeah, but he was bracketed. Oh, that the first was shot. a bracketing shot. This oh, shot yeah, was yeah. the last that's shot before that. that's, that's, oh, that's interesting. What book is that? It's called the, the Pentagon Papers. Oh, the Pentagon Papers, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. I didn't remember that photograph. Okay, ready? So, oh, two sides here. Okay, right, go ahead. Good, I'm glad to see the young people. He was encouraging the young people to uh, be first in their questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hello, Dr. Ellsberg. Uh, my name is Ben, and uh, you're a personal hero of mine. And I just wanted to thank you for coming out to FAU and giving us this talk today. Um, I was uh, wondering, you, you were mentioning how uh, we have vested interests in keeping democracy from various third world countries or countries that we have interest in for oil or for whatever resources. So I was wondering, uh, you know, uh, looking from the standpoint that we live in a consumer culture, a culture where people like to buy things and, you know, that's, that's what drives the entire economy. Uh, how do you think we can possibly reconcile that? Do you think, I mean, if I can ask the people out here, how many people are willing to lose some of their wealth so that other people in the third world can have rights? Are you, uh, uh, half of your wealth, how about that half of the money that you have? 75%, 80%, 90%. I mean, uh, how do, we, how do we repair this? How do, how do we uh, go forward if we're going to have the same culture of consumerism and at the same time not wage war and keep dictatorships in power? Well, the, Thank the, you. Yeah. Okay. The consumerism is a very broad subject, obviously, in which we're all implicated, and certainly including me and everybody, and a very great bearing, of course, on, on the climate problem, which is something I didn't even talk about today. And I didn't talk much about the nuclear problem, which is my main focus of concern, but the climate problem. But our, our spending and burning of fossil fuel, obviously, is something we're all implicated in, but which is very much organized by the people who, above all, profit from the consumer goods in general, very specifically from the, from the burning of fossil fuels. But uh, when the uh, question there was on what could we do in terms of con controlling our own consumerism, I thought he was referring, and maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, to the possibility of using boycotts of various kinds. Um, and I want to mention in that connection something that struck me very much. I've mentioned that uh, two names from the past, from my past, have been very much in the news. Uh, Frank Wisner, who was a buddy of mine in Vietnam, and Dick Holbrook, who I knew very well. But a third name I learned on Monday in the New York Times very much a part of my life, especially by his writings. Uh, and that was the name Gene Sharp. Now, how many people have noticed that in the press, in the, maybe in the New York Times article? Anybody? Nobody? Seriously. Take a look at the article on what inspired the revolts in Tunisia, the tactics and the goals and the commitment in Tunisia and Egypt. And the article in the New York Times, which you can see in the, in the, uh, uh, the net, if you, didn't, if you don't have it, talks about how they coordinated for months on the writings of an American scholar named Gene Sharp, who was a Korean War uh, draft resistor, went to prison, uh, pacifist at that time, and uh, who has spent the rest of his life cataloging the instances of nonviolent action in the world going back in the last century, many, many, many of them, great accounts, and the principles of nonviolent action. And I urge you, uh, actually, when I watched what was happening on, uh, uh, in Egypt and Tunisia, I was so inspired by the, uh, the clear indications that they were following the principles that had inspired me 40 years ago, that I finally got around to looking at a DVD people had given me, 
long ago, and that I never it had been on, uh, on I think PBS, called a force more powerful. Now, anybody here heard of that? Can I see? I see one person, only a couple. Well, I urge you to go to the website, aforcemorepowerful.org, one word, aforcemorepowerful.org, and see their, their uh, references and how to order the DVD, which is tremendously inspiring and shows that what happened in the Middle East right now, what's happening, which we don't know how will end yet, and some of these events go down, are, are crushed, and uh, I have to say, and this will sound, I have to say it will not be, uh, make the U.S. administration, whether it was Republican or American or uh, Democratic, unhappy if this revolt fails to establish a truly democratic government and instead leads to a kind of military dictatorship. That's what we've backed for many years and uh, I'm sure is still our basic preference there. But it may not. And what that DVD, Force More Powerful, shows is uh, how often they have succeeded. As we know in East Europe, of course, but in South Africa, in the American Civil Rights Movement, there are amazing examples in detail of how this works. So I, I really urge you to do that. Force More Powerful, there's also a book which gives that. Uh, there's another website that they refer to, nonviolent.conflict, no, nonviolent hyphen conflict, nonviolent hyphen conflict.org, which again gives a lot of resources. And one of those is Gene Sharp's uh, little excerpt from his many books on this subject, which I recommend, 198 Forms of Nonviolence Action. And I just was reading them over, and I found I could, even from my own knowledge, add nine or 10 to that. But of course, boycotts, that's where I came into this. The idea of using your consumer power as in the South African case, which uh, Bishop Tutu asked for, the boycott of South African goods had a very major effect on the peaceful change there. So that's, that's one effect. Uh, let me just say there is a movement, and this is extremely controversial, in this audience too, probably, of boycotting uh, Israel goods that, uh, that support the occupation policies, police goods, surveillance goods of various kinds by various means in the West Bank and in Gaza. And that's, I said, could not be more of a fiery controversy, the very thought of that in this country. But uh, uh, I would have no doubt that it is this kind of thing that deserves consideration, I'm going to say. So, okay, that's a long answer. But I, I did want to bring in the point about Gene Sharp, which I think as was said in this over and over in the Times article, they read Gene Sharp, an American. He deserves as much credit for that as Thoreau, I would say, in the uh, later civil rights movement, and, uh, uh, and Martin Luther King. Thanks. Oh, yeah, over here. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm curious to know how you feel then and now in terms of... Um, your allegiance to the United States as well as your citizenship as an American citizen considering how the government um, went to so many lengths to thwart your publication of the Pentagon Papers and um, all the different lengths they went to to keep them from being circulated. Um, how you feel as an American citizen knowing that the government tried to do that and how you reconcile that now. What they tried to do to me? Right. Uh, well, uh, of course, on the whole they failed, I'm, I'm glad to say. Uh, but. Uh, the Pentagon Papers evoked uh, in the White House the kind of extra-legal committee and uh, operatives that Joe Wilson, Ambassador Joe Wilson, evoked when he revealed that the Vice President was lying or giving a false picture of the threat of nuclear weapons by Saddam Hussein. And of course, they had a whole committee working on him which led to the revelation of Valerie Plain's name, his wife's name, and the destruction of her covert network against non-proliferation. I have no doubt that, well, in fact, we know that there is as much attention being given right now to Julian Assange and, of course, Bradley Manning. They have, they are, in effect, torture light, if you like, right now in his solitary confinement to break that down. Uh, these are, that's Republican administration, Democratic administration, totally criminal in the case of me, uh, and yet, to show how far we've fallen, 
ver nearly everything done against me, namely going into my former doctor's office in a burglary authorized by the White House in order to get information to blackmail me with into silence about what Nixon was doing, uh, now legal under the Patriot Act, just renewed. Uh, the President uh, Obama wanted it renewed, uh, I think, indefinitely. The Republicans have been backing off from that. Civil libertarians among the Republicans, including Tea Party people, and actually beat a vote on it last week. Now it's been voted in the House. The Republicans, are, the House is calling for nine months extension. Uh, the uh, Senate, I think, has just authorized a three-month extension, sort of kicking it down the road. Obama wants an indefinite, or at least a much longer extension, of what amounts to our emergency laws. The kind of thing that we're calling on the military, which they have not yet done in Egypt, to revoke in terms of detention capability, suppression of free speech of various things, is in many ways accepted in the Patriot Act. Second, uh, I was overheard on warrantless wiretaps, blatantly criminal at, uh, at that time, which led to Nixon's major factor in his impeachment hearings, which led him to resign. So, you know, I'm glad that he, he did that against me. Uh, it turned out well the Constitution was preserved, and Nixon faced prosecution for that. Now legal, with Obama's support, having done a 180 degree turn on that during the campaign. Mm -hmm. After he, his nomination was secured, he supported the warrantless wiretapping. Now it's legal. So he wouldn't have to be hidden. He wouldn't be faced with impeachment when that comes out. How many um, journalists are being listened to and their sources by national security agency, in my case it was the FBI, or the FBI, right now. How many congresspersons are being listened to uh, right now by NSA? We don't know. No Congress committee has been able to get that information out of either the Republican Attorney General or the Democratic Attorney General. But uh, let me guess, that's something I would very much like to see leaked. It should be leaked at that point. And uh, finally, uh, they brought out, well, they used the CIA against me, at that time illegal. Psychological profile against me, which had done earlier only against Castro and Sukarno and various foreign leaders. They did it against an American citizen to manipulate me, see how to manipulate me. Never been done to an American before. Again, faced the CIA with, uh, with restrictions that actually were put on it for a while. Now legal under the Patriot Act, just extended. The CIA now is merged with the FBI, in effect, and uh, local police forces and everything else, fusion centers in against American citizens. It is a secret intelligence agency against American citizens now. That is a descent that's like a fall from a cliff uh, into degradation as far as uh, democracy is concerned, or the possibility of democracy. And finally, something I would have said was not legal, is the use of uh, uh, CIA assets with orders to incapacitate me totally on the steps of the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, not the Pentagon. I was a recent. On the steps of the Capitol on May 3rd, 1972, with orders to incapacitate me totally at orders of the Oval Office. I would have said that one wasn't legal yet. Wrong. Obama has claimed the right to execute American citizens like Anwar al Olaki on a death list. As a matter of fact, uh, I just read, uh, coming from the airport here uh, yesterday, uh, an article, I think it was in the Newsweek, I bought several magazines, I think this one was in Newsweek, on our drone attacks, on the assassination list, which isn't really a list, but it's just a set of orders for assassination that the President Obama, following Bush and Cheney, has ordered for execution with no legal charges brought against them, no due process, no judge, jury, just executioner on this. The, says the, DO, the uh, CIA says it's legal, but says the article, others question that. Talk about pharaoh or absolute monarch. George III did not have that, uh, that power at that point and hadn't uh, nothing since John I, since the Magna Carta. That is absolutely uh, cutting against the, the very foundations of the rule of law in this country and doing it almost without 
without protest in this country. So what do I feel? Well, all those things failed against me. So I came out of it luckily, very, very luckily by chance. But they don't fail against everyone. And uh, uh, American citizens have been detained and tortured and having later been found to be totally innocent, misrepresented, uh, misjudgment uh, of identity. It's a, a kind of a quality you, that defines tyranny. So we have a monarch right now. And I'm sure we could have worse monarchs. That's why I'll vote for this monarch if I, if I were in Florida in 2012, rather than a worse monarch, probably. But that's not what I wanted. And I'm really putting it to you, this audience, uh, more forcefully than I have in recent years because of the hope I'm seeing that monarchy backed by the US empire and government can be opposed by nonviolent, courageous action. And that hope in me, which is new this week, leads me to say, these are abuses and depredations. These are counter-revolutionary, and I'm talking about American revolutionary, um, to install the things that were done against me as practices here and as legitimate practices that deserve as much commitment as we've seen in Egypt or on the streets of Yemen today or in Tunisia. They, people have died, but only among the resistors. And far fewer have died than if they had used violence and uh, moreover, we would, uh, as I say, Mubarak would still be there if they used the violence. So the nonviolent resistance in, a, in courageous, I think, has a possibility for changing these atrocious uh, legal, uh, extra legal practices that we're seeing right now. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your time today. Um, I believe that today's society, especially the youth, is very, overwhelmed, um, distracted, and therefore rather apathetic towards our political system. Um, I think a large part of that is due to the economic system that I believe the previous gentleman was referring to. Um, so I guess my question, my first question is, one, do you, do you see that? Do you believe that our youth is rather apathetic in the way that I see it? And What's the question? Uh, say it again. Do, do you believe that our youth has become very apathetic towards a political system? And secondly, if you do, how do we go about, you know, what are those first steps sort of towards eliminating that, that feeling that I, that I see yeah. quite a bit today, unfortunately? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, well, as I said earlier, um, well, first, the, the apathy is, I'm not sure, a part of it is apathy, and part of it is just discouragement. Take, uh, for instance, on February 15th, 2003, 10 to 15 million people demonstrated on one day around the world. Couldn't have happened without the internet. There'd never been coordinated action like that in, any, uh, in, the, in the world. Of course, that was February 15th. Two days later, the shock and awe began. I think that discouraged people very, very thoroughly. That demonstrative action or the demonstrations as we'd seen them, it's been very hard to get people to come to demonstrations later. I've spoken at everyone that gets called pretty much, but not with any expectation I'm gonna see very many people there, and generally I don't. I just do it because it's happening and I don't wanna let it go by, but I understand the feeling, what's the use? Well, of course, we're seeing amazing, amazing results in the Middle East, but you can still say, well, that's over there. Um, but, the, but there is a big difference. Uh, we, we need to learn, and they were learning. They did not go to that square with the intent of leaving it in, in the afternoon or in one day. For instance, what's happening in Yemen right now, they've had demonstrations against the regime, it seems, constantly for years by the opposition parties that are allowed. But they all leave by midday as they're asked to. This, what's new now? They ain't leaving. They're going into Pearl Square, which they are renaming Tahrir Square, Liberation square in honor of the Egyptians. They're changing their tactics and they're learning in a way that puts real pressure on the regime. Now, that doesn't mean that I think that demonstrations alone uh, or even, even a major part are what we need, although they do reveal to each other how many of us there are. That can, if there's a lot, that's good. If it's just a few, it's discouraging. But, um, or civil disobedience of various kinds. But what it does reveal is that creative and committed and conscientious and courageous actions that actually put some pressure on people or institutions at risk to ourselves, go beyond 
go beyond the range of actions that is defined by no risk of our job, of our relationships, of our image. Ask yourselves to say the question that I was suggesting earlier, what could we do if we were prepared to be called traitors, which I can tell you is extremely unpleasant uh, for somebody who grew up as I did, as, for most people. But you're not made of sugar, really, it turns out, and uh, I found. And uh, you, you get used to anything, although it takes a long time to get used to that one. But it needn't stop you entirely. In fact, I have to say, you know, not being called a traitor by Ann Coulter now is uh, like not being on Nixon's enemies list. Uh, it's a source of embarrassment. And uh, in fact, I'm a little bit disturbed. I just found that Glenn Green, Green, Greenwald, who I urge you to read, I read him every day, my mentor in salon.com, on constitutional issues, is regarded as the big supporter of uh, WikiLeaks and a private firm working for the Bank of America, through their region, has now targeted Glenn Greenwald to take him down, uh, pro uh, pro uh, confront him with professional loss of his status, in which case they think he'll back down, which is how stupid the, this firm is. But I must say, I had mixed feelings when I read that. They're focusing on Glenn Greenwald as the biggest supporter of WikiLeaks. And I thought, now wait, Glenn Greenwald is my hero, he's great, but I'm as big a supporter of WikiLeaks as he is. Uh, uh, I really have mixed feelings about not being targeted uh, by this firm. I'm not uh, really eager. But uh, I think, wait a minute, what am I, you know? Uh, don't I count for anything anymore? So uh, the point is that, yes, you will get, you will, there are real risks on this. But look at the people who went to Tahrir Square. They knew they were risking being beaten, as many of them were, or being killed or massacred like the pe by the tanks, by the people in uh, Tiananmen Square. They were taking that risk. How many of them were saying to each other, this is going to end the regime? In the first days, inconceivable. And they must have been saying to themselves what anybody would say, what Bradley Manning, or people who could reveal the truth about anything would say, why me? You know, what's the use? How, what difference will it make? Let other people do it. You know, it's, uh, it's hopeless. And uh, there are other things to do, and so forth and so forth, which I which is what kept people from putting out the Pentagon Papers or telling the truth in 64, all the hundreds of people who could have done that, including me. But, uh, and isn't the alternative worse? And yet they went and they had this amazing effect. So, anyway, that's uh, uh, what these people are showing to us is they're, they're challenging the United States. I hope they're inspiring the United States. Our need, oh, the, the question was what can we do? Our need to bring pressure like that on our representatives in Congress, on the press, when they fail to bring out stories that are on the internet, possibility of going to your local paper and saying, look, this was in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, this one was in uh, somewhere else, this is in, how come you didn't cover it? For example, getting the word out, assuring that uh, letters to the editor of this kind get in, Telling your congressperson, you ain't going to leave their office. People have done that. You ain't going to leave your office until you get straight on this issue. And if you want to arrest us, uh, so be it. Let's do that. I think there's a tremendous possibilities. There's tremendous possibilities for real pressure. That includes money to people who have taken that effort, like the people facing prosecution right now, Bradley Manning and the others. There's a Bradley Manning advocacy project for funding. And I want to see a joint funding of all the four other people who are facing prosecution for leaks right now. I'm going to try to organize that effort. But being creative, look up Gene Sharp, look at that list of 198, and see, hmm, what could I do on that list? It's a menu. Dr. Ellsberg, you certainly have reinforced my cynicism about politicians. My uh, favorite bumper sticker goes, um, politicians and diapers are full of the same thing and need to be changed often for the same reason. But Mike, that, that uh, girl asked about uh, apathy and what we should do. It seems to me one of the biggest changes that we've had and as far as from Vietnam all the way to here is the lack of the draft. When we had that draft and we had those numbers, there was involvement by students 
like this university. There is no student involvement in anything concerning our government, and I think that's where it has to be. Well, that square in Egypt is filled with young people. The young people in this country are apathetic. I, I personally asking you, what about the draft and how it would influence what's going on today? I could get, that's a good question, and I could <laughs> give a long answer as I've been doing here. I'm going to try, and I, I can't promise to, to carry out in this, to give shorter answers because I know that so many people here, not easy for me to do. And this is one that would tempt me to a long answer, but I'll, I'll make it as short as I can. Um, there's no question that the lack of a draft keeps young people and their parents from focusing on uh, the wars as they did in the 60s. Though even there, by the way, it wasn't so much the draft, it was the people, for the parents, as the fact that people were getting killed in large numbers over there. The war was very large, eventually 58,000 people dead. And uh, one of the parts of resistance, a lot of the people who inspired me were not afraid of dying. They were ready to go to prison to oppose this war. But uh, many others, um, uh, were especially inspired to say, my God, I can go over there and get killed in a war I don't believe in. The problem with a draft, which many people see, well, that's what we need to get the opposition, is that it gives the president a virtually open-ended uh, source of recruits. In a situation where several administrations, uh, and are, uh, despite their, their talking about the volunteer army, want a larger armed forces, larger, more, more expensive, by the way, uh, and larger. And I believe with a draft, they would have that. And I believe if we'd had a draft, we would, in fact, have bigger demonstrations and bigger wars, despite the demonstrations, as in Vietnam. Uh, the, the war went on for 10 years in Vietnam, although the ending of the draft did really cut down the resistance to it. Considerably, but the earlier resistance did not manage to shorten it very much. And the fact is, we could never have put 550,000 troops in Vietnam with a recommendation for 700,000 or a million without the draft. We couldn't, there would have been no possibility for doing that in Vietnam. I believe if we get a draft, and really with another 9 11 here, with another 9 11, which could happen, I think we will have a draft. And then we'll test this proposition. My expectation. And by the way, it would be hard to avoid women being part of that uh, nowadays. And so that would evoke a lot of opposition. And I think we'd have hundreds of thousands of people in Afghanistan and hundreds of thousands in uh, Iraq and, and going into Pakistan and so forth. So I can't, uh, I can't favor that now. I think, uh, I, yes, it would have political effects, but it would give so much of a free hand to the president. And keep in mind, each president we've had, Republican and Democrat, believes that we need larger forces and believes that we have a right and a need for over 800 American bases in the world. People wonder, you know, is this an American empire? Is that a fair name? There's never been a country that had 800 bases in foreign countries all over the world. Uh, at great expense, by the way. You want to deal with the deficit? You could do it in a year by getting rid of those bases. And if you ask yourself really slowly, what, what are they for? How about, how about doing what Kucinich and Barbara Lee and others have been calling for and the Black Caucus for years? Vast cuts in the defense budget, which certainly should occur. There's no excuse for the Afghan money, just the money alone being spent. Absolutely no excuse now. We cannot afford that, or in Iraq, or in these other places. So um, uh, these, are all, these are all things that could help get us out of our hole if we address them.